Is anybody grateful that heaven came to earth? Amen. Come on, give him the praise he deserves. That's what Christmas is about. God with us, Emmanuel. God looked at his creation, knew he needed an ultimate sacrifice. Knew that he had to make a way to be right with us forever. So that way for all of eternity, just as we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. I don't know about you, but I don't want to wait until heaven to give Jesus the praise that he deserves. Amen? So Jesus, we thank you. As Jake said, we find in Isaiah 7, Emmanuel. Isaiah has taken place about 700 years prior to the birth of Jesus. And they're waiting for a leader. They're waiting for the messianic leader to come. Had no idea really what that entailed, but Isaiah 7 says that God is with us. And that the virgin would, would give birth to a son. And they didn't quite know what that meant, but they're awaiting. Chapter 9 of Isaiah, though, describes to us what this Messiah will be like in verse 6. It says, For a ch child is born to us, a son is given to us. Somebody say, to us. The gospel's not just about us, but we need to know God did have us in mind. It says the government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This Messiah, God with us, Emmanuel, his name is Jesus. Jesus means the God who saves. Jesus is his name, but the characteristics of Jesus' life is that he's a wonderful counselor. That in whatever situation you're going through, when there's no other people to turn to, he's there saying, come to me, all who are weary and weak. He's the one who's mighty God. Not only is he mighty, but he's also God. No matter what situation you're in, he can triumph it because he is God and God alone. And today we're gonna finish this series by looking at two things. How he is everlasting father and he is prince of peace. See, Jesus not only came to save and sustain us, church, he came to give us a love that only comes from the Father, and he came to give us a peace that only he can give. So I don't know where you're at this Christmas season. I don't know how many Christmas dinners you've already had and looking to have. I don't know how much fun you've had or looking to have or how hard it'll be. But here's what I want us to know, that God is with us, Emmanuel, yesterday, today, and forever. And with that in mind, he is worthy of all praise. Amen? So Father, we come into prayer and we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you sent your son to die for us. God, I believe that through every circumstance, because you are a good father, you give us peace. And thank you for giving your son Jesus to model the characteristics of you. So, Lord, would you move in a powerful way? Can you do what only you can do today? We love you. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Hey, as Morgan said, next week is our Christmas Eve service. We're excited for that. I know many of you have Christmas Eve plans, I'm sure. Uh, if you can make it, man, you don't want to miss it. I don't know about you, but there's no better way to celebrate Christmas Eve than to come and worship together as a church family. Amen. So if you're able to do that, come and be with us. We're going to have a family breakfast at 9 o'clock. And if you don't have kids, that is for you. It's the family of God coming together. We're going to have that at 9 back in the kids area. And then at 1045, we'll be together for one service. And it's going to be special. Um, I'm curious, any of y'all have younger siblings that you took care of a little bit when you are when you're younger? Raise your hand. Okay, some of you, right? Some of y'all are the younger sibling and your older siblings here and you need to pray you know, for them today, right? Because they, they just messed you up. You got some PTSD. Uh, for the, most of my life, I was an only child until my little brother Jagger came into the earth. Many of you know him, and, and I actually have two more siblings now. But when he came into the world, I was a, almost a, a teenager, uh, I believe. I, I remember at one point in time, he was getting old enough to where I was you know, there with him, just kind of taking care of him, watching him. And one particular day, my dad said, hey, I'm going to run to the store. I need you to watch him, okay? Don't leave. Stay right here. Watch him. He's asleep back in the room. You need to just call me if something happens. I said, I got it. I'm your man, right? I won't leave. I'm right here. 
about that time when he leaves, the door knocks. I'm like, that's weird. He just left. It was my friends. We were living in Springfield, and my friends rode their bikes over and said, hey, let's play basketball. I said, man, I can't. I said, I'm a really good brother. I said, I, uh, I'm so trusted that I'm here to watch my little brother. So uh, I'll tell you what, y'all just go downstairs and play. No problem. I'll be up here, right, being just the superior brother, right? And so they begin to play, and, and all of a sudden, I just had this urge. I'm like, listen, I can't just do that. I got to go and play with my friends, right? That wouldn't be a good friend for them to drive all the way here and not just at least go out there. And so I begin to play with them, and I knew I had an hour, right? And you can't make this up. I knew it wasn't an hour, but I know when you're having fun, time goes by. I'm starting to shoot, and I look in the side of my peripheral, and I realize that car looks very familiar. That car might be my dad's car. Matter of fact, that is my dad. And I remember thinking, what do I do? Do I play dead? But I didn't think that would work, so I threw that one out. I'm like, well, maybe I'll just come up with some lame excuse. And so I went with plan B, and that didn't work either, right? He got out of the car, and my friends were like, hey, I'm going to holler at you later. I'll see you later, right? And I was like, I'm in trouble. Um, Yeah, I'll just say, uh, yeah, I got in trouble that day. That's what we'll say. But I went back in, and it's funny, I forgot to share the end of the story uh, if my brother was still asleep. And they're like, hey, was he still in there? I'm like, no, he got out, and we couldn't find him for a month, right? No, he was in there asleep. (laughs) But I remember that moment. Like, I had a responsibility, and I just didn't do what I needed to do, right? And so as time went on and and my little brother got older and then my two siblings came into the earth and at this point in time, you know, I'm much older than them. I'm more mature. You know, they can count on me. I've, I've, I've put it upon myself through the power of the Holy Spirit to provide a father figure in all three of their lives. It looks different through different circumstances within our family, um, DNA, if you will. I have played a father figure for a lot of them, right? I'm their sibling, but I've tried to be there for them. But not only that, I've really tried to provide the peace in their lives, right? I, I try to have intentional conversations. I, I, I don't want to just give them gifts. I, I want to go and, and take them out and, and talk to them about how life is going. And that's hard when you're the brother. But, man, I have felt that responsibility since I've been a, a young kid that, man, I want to be able to do that for people. And, and me telling you that here today, some of you, you can relate. Based on your own family circumstances and your your dynamics, you've really had to step up and and be the older brother, be the older sister to kind of help where there was help needed. Others of you, somebody's played that role for you. And and for some of you today, when you you think about this idea that, that Jesus is our everlasting father, that terminology of father has a negative connotation. Some of you are here this Christmas season, and, and that term father is hard. Maybe dad wasn't in your life, and, and every time you hear that, it's really tough. Or maybe you had a great life. You loved your earthly father, and he's not here anymore. It looks different, and it is tough. Others of you, this is such a great word because you've, you've been able to see the, the heavenly, heavenly father's love through your earthly father. But regardless if it's a good or bad situation, can we all agree today, for those who are children of God, we have an everlasting Father who will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? Amen. That no matter what situation in, when, when we needed peace, God can be trusted every time. Man, some of you, you've been let down time and time again, and, and, it, and what you've done is you projected your earthly father upon your heavenly father, and let me tell you, your heavenly father is everything that you ever dreamt you could have, and he's so faithful. But when Isaiah is describing Jesus as everlasting father, he wasn't mixing up the trinity, right? We know the Holy Spirit is the authoritative word of God. It, it was absolutely written by the Holy Spirit through different people. But God is three in one. Many of you know this. Some of you, you're new to church. We believe that that God is three in one. You have God the Father, God the Son, who is fully God, fully man, and God the Holy Spirit. Does anybody still believe we have a God who is three in one? Which means he's bigger than us. Some of you, you're new to that. But we want to embrace you into the conversation. But what we want to look at here today is, is that Jesus came to us, Emmanuel, God with us, to show us the Father's eternal love and give us a peace that this world could never give. See, everyone wants to be accepted by their Father. Even if you've never met your Father, there's people in this room who I'm good friends with, you've never met your Father. And so, so there's other people who've played that role. But even if you've had a good situation with your family, we want to be 
we, we want somebody to be proud of us. We want people to show up and say, good job. We want people to say, hey, keep on going, kid. Hey, we want to be able to be recognized. And when that is not there, it begins to give us a, a lack of peace that we begin to ask people to fill that role. We don't actually ask that. But we begin to try to make people the, the foundation of our lives. We can even do it to our kids. We want our kids to, to bring us a peace so bad. We, we want to be good dads and good moms to them. And, and because those people weren't in our lives or they did certain things, we just want to give them the best life. And there's nothing wrong with that. But here's what I want to remind us this Christmas season. God has to be the foundation of our lives because if he is not enough, no one else or anything else will ever be enough. Amen? Like, that is what has to take place. And so with that in mind, I want us to break down Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace and what Isaiah talks about. And this, again, is a messianic prophecy about who the Messiah will be and, and where he will come from. And this, this idea of wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, those were characteristics of who Jesus would be. Those are things that he would do. His name is Jesus, but this is what he will do. But everlasting, eternal, forever. My wife Maddie, she was talking about how we will sing holy, holy, holy forever. And I know in you and I in our minds, we're like, that might get boring after a while, right? It won't. It'll be special. We'll, we'll have other responsibilities, but we will be so wrapped up in God's holiness that it will be amazing. But here's what I want you to do. Just, just humor me. Whatever the best positive image that you can think of, of what an earthly father should be. And, and on the best day with that earthly father. Like, like if you could just come up with the best day with you and your dad. I want you to multiply that by infinity of how good heaven will be. As every day we are in the father's presence knowing that is my dad and he loves me so much. Like I'm holding my little boy. This is like our first Christmas with him, right, where he just, he, like, he, he's getting it, and, and he just runs to me, and, and he's just crazy, bangs his head on everything, but I'm like, okay. But he runs, and I'm just like, I'm so proud of you. But if you really think of it, what has he done? Use the restroom a lot and make messes. Like, Maddie just bought all these things to, like, you know, child-proof your your. You, you know, your whole house, you've been there. Parents, you know what I'm talking about, right? They get every drawer out, and I'm like, stop it, right? He just gets everything out. I forgot that we did that this morning. I was trying to get ready, and I couldn't get my stuff out. Like, I love him, but let's just be honest. Right now, he hasn't contributed much. If that offends you, I don't care. But it's my love as a father where he hasn't really done anything for me as far as adding value to folding clothes or whatever it might be, but his presence alone brings me so much joy because he's my son. And God is looking at you today, Man, you feel like you haven't done that much, but he's looking at you and he's saying, I just love you because you're my daughter and I care for you. You're my son and I love you that much. That's the father who we will have forever. That's good news today, church. That's good news. See, and Jesus shows us Again, he is the son. He's the son of God. You have God the Father. And you have the Holy Spirit. But his life here on earth exemplified the heavenly Father's love for mankind. Let's look at it. In John chapter 14, verse 9 through 10, it says, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me, he's talking to his disciples, to now show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. So you see the separation in the sense that they're their own beings, but you see the togetherness of how they are one. And Jesus is revealing right here his identity is God. He, he was born in Bethlehem, we know that, right, 2,000 years ago. It was an amazing event, but he grew up, and at the age of 30, he began his ministry. And for three years, he healed people, he taught people. It was incredible. But he was prepping his disciples, listen, I'm going to die, I'm going to raise again three days later, I'm going to ascend to the Father, but I'm going to be with you always, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And they couldn't wrap their mind around it. 
Just like people in Isaiah had no idea what the virgin birth meant. They had no idea what, what Emmanuel meant. They just, okay, we trust you. But in this moment, the disciples couldn't quite comprehend. But Jesus, if you go there, we're going to be here by ourselves. Well, like, we want you right here. We want to touch you. We want to see you do these miracles. And he says, no, it's better that I go. And, and he begins to describe, listen, you want me to show you the Father, but you've already been shown the Father. The way that I've loved you, the way that I cared for you, the way here in a few days I'm going to die for you, that's God's love for you. Church, I, I need us to know because I know we're in the Bible Belt and we read this thing and it's powerful and we love it, but if we're not careful, we will, be, we will begin to be callous to the Word of God. This is honest God truth. I'm not trying to sound super spiritual. This is my own daily devotion. Man, I, I don't read the, the Bible for sermon content. I read the Bible because man, the, the wor I believe the word of God is what I need every day. Whether I ever preach another message again or not, I don't care. I'm reading this. Amen. And I just need you to know, as pastors and leaders, this content that we preach it's not the only time that we're reading the Word of God. Before we were pastors, we were people who sought the Lord and believed this is the Word of God. But a few, excuse me, this is the past week. I hadn't fallen into some deep, dark sin. But I just was feeling a little bit, maybe because of the holidays and everything that that entails, I just felt a little bit, not unlovable, but I would just say I felt like there was a barrier. I felt like there's a little bit of distance between the Father and, and me, not because of him, but just me, my unworthiness. And, you know, I'm human, obviously. And I'm just like, I was reading the word and reading Psalms. And he cast our sins out from, you know, from the east to the west. And I, I was going to the New Testament and, and just seeing the way that he loves me. And, and, and then I just kept going and I was looking at Proverbs of God's love. And, and I just said, God, do you still? You still love me that much? Like, God, you see me on my worst days. God, God, God you see me when I just have been in a hurry and I've missed it. God, I've been preaching this for a long time. Do you really still love me that much? Listen, I'm not saying this to try to be cute preaching a sermon. This is coming from a, a son of God who has a, a strange relationship with his earthly father. I said, God, do you really love me that much? He says, I do. Just said, God, I'm so thankful. Church, I want to remind you here today that on your worst days, God loves you like it was your best day. Amen. That's how good he is. There, I'm not saying there's not discipline. I'm not saying that there's not certain things. But, and I've taught this before, but I'm going to teach it real quick. A lot of times people associate condemnation with God. Condemnation is not of God. Conviction is of God. Conviction is, hey, I have something better for you. If, if God convicts me saying, Dylan, that is not what we do. If my little boy knocks and a little girl Navy, as they get older and as they make mistakes, praying to God that, that they don't go down the path that I went, but I'm going to say, hey, that's not who we are. And I'm not saying that's not what Robinsons do. I'm going to say that's not what children of God do. Some of you, you've tried to have behavior modification. You've parented this way. And I'm not telling you how to parent. I've been a parent for like three years now. But what I am saying is we don't parent based on what the world tells us to do. We parent based on what the Word of God tells us to do. Right? That's not who we are. That's not what we do because it's not what Jesus does. And, and, and as I began just to, to sit there and, and listen to the Lord's love, and, and yes, there's correction and, 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 and conviction, but when the condemnation comes, it's like that sinful, just evil jab that the enemy does. You're nothing. You've messed up again. How, I mean, did you really say that? Did you really do that? Did you mean it? Why, would you just, did you, why are you still talking? Sometimes I'm like, I don't know. And, and, I, and I just sometimes I, I do, I, I want to go to my office and just be like, it would be so much easier just to just shut up. 
But it's in those moments where I realize that is the voice of the father of lies. My everlasting father says, I love you and I have a hope and a future for you. And some of you have walked in here today associating your earthly father's relationship upon that with, with our heavenly father. And you begin to put the, the father of lies condemnation upon the conviction of your heavenly father. And let me tell you, both of those are lies. We have an everlasting father who is there for us every time. John 15, 9 says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. He's talking to the disciples, but we are, are disciples. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a disciple just like they were. We're not the early 12, but we're disciples. We're followers. And, and if you notice this, he says that I have loved you as the Father has loved me. Check this out, church. Jesus, fully God, fully man, came down to the earth, loved his disciples. In such a way that resembles the Heavenly Father, the God who spoke creation into existence. Jesus came and loved them that much. Let's think about Peter for a second. Jesus predicts betrayal and denial. And what's Peter said? <laughs> Those fools do that? I ain't never doing it. And don't you know, he's like, Peter, just shut up. Peter, matter of fact, you're going to deny me three times. Pfft, not me. That night he does it. I didn't preach this last service. Hopefully it's for someone or it's just coming out of my memory, but I hope it's for someone. What does Jesus do to Peter after Jesus dies and resurrects again and appears to the disciples? He sees Peter and the disciples are eating dinner. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Jesus, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? And it says it hurt him. Why did Jesus ask him three times if he loved him? Because Peter denied him three times. And I don't believe that Jesus was bringing that back to, you know, just bring condemnation on him. I think Jesus brought that back to say, every time you denied me, my love covered it every single time. And many of you here today are so terrified to even come back to church. You haven't been to church in a long time, but it's Christmas. You're like, my grandma asked me, so I came today, right? I'm kind of interested in her, so I'm going to go to church. And you're here today, and you're like, I just want to get out of here as quick as possible. The Chiefs play at 12, and so we just got to hurry. And I just want to invite you into this journey, this conversation. Even if you don't get anything out of it, just say this. Jesus is looking at you, and his love is extended to you, and it is up to you to either accept it or reject it. And if you reject that, you will have an absence of God's peace the rest of your life. But if you begin to accept it, you will walk in that eternal peace the rest of your life. But not only is he everlasting father, he is the prince of peace, right? See, peace means wholeness or completeness. But before I talk about the circumstantial peace, I just want to tell you, what's the, what's the overall, the overarching form of peace that Jesus brought to mankind? It's the separation between God and mankind that sin did. God, God sent his son Jesus into the earth. And some of us, we need to be reminded here today. You're just thinking it's just another cute little service and let's talk about sweet little baby Jesus, right? Let's just move on. No, 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 no. Why did Jesus come? He wasn't in a manger forever, right? It's a beautiful time. We need to think about it. But he came to pay the price for you and I's sin. That's how he brought peace. But then there's this internal peace of every circumstance. He's able to bring a peace that we have no idea about, right? Jesus talks to his disciples about this. He reiterates it. John 15, 27, I am leaving with you a gift. Anybody like gifts? I like gifts. Don't judge me. I give them as well. I'm giving you a gift. A gift that will never run out. It's a gift of peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give is the gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Do you know how many times I've fallen for the trap of, man, that gift's going to really fulfill me until it doesn't. Like Maddie and I are already in that stage, right, where we get to like, oh, my gosh, they're going to love this gift. And they do. And about 10 minutes later, they're like, this is the best box I've ever seen in my life. You're like, I could have got that at the store for free. Because the gift will only bring peace for the time that it's relevant and new. But the moment it loses 
It's newness. It becomes irrelevant. And then we look for more gifts to begin to bring us peace. But I'm here to tell you, the only peace that we will ever find to fulfill us in every season is the peace that came from Jesus in Bethlehem. Honest to God truth. I wouldn't plan on sharing it. Uh, today's service at all. I ended up sharing it for a service. I'm going to tell it this service as well. I'm not going to get into all the details, but if you were here last Easter, you remember that we played this story of the Moores family. It's a very tragic story. Tragic. It, it, it's one that you could see a Netflix documentary being written about, honest to God. It's that type. And this has been played out for a long time, and this past week, Brendan, myself, and others of this congregation went to the the final sentence date. And and there we are are in this courtroom, and again, I'm not going to get into specifics today, but this courtroom is is filled with a situation that would break your heart. You can't even imagine. And, And before we go into the courtroom... With the group of people and the family's like, let's pray. I'm like, that's a great thing to do. And, and, and somebody from this church begins to pray, and, and, and they're praying not just for a peace for the family, but they're praying for the peace of the person who caused the pain to the family. And I believe it theologically, but sometimes when you see it in real life and when it's to that severity, severe, you're just like, I don't know. And I looked to the family to see if that prayer offends them. They said, amen. They, 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 they pray for this person who took people from their family forever. They prayed for this individual's salvation. They prayed that they would know the peace of God. We go into the court. And you hear the victim testimonies and you see this individual sitting up there, and it was, you see these cops, strong, grown men, trying not to cry, but they can't help it because of the details. And I'm sitting there with this theological conundrum, if you will, where I believe it, but I don't know if I could apply it. And they get done, and there we are outside, and they want to pray again. And they pray again, and they extend love to the person's family. And I'm sitting there all messed up. I'm trying everything I can, not just the ball. I'm the one walking out messed up internally and haven't experienced any of this yet. Here they are while they've absolutely had pain. There's the presence of God and the peace of God in them in a way that I've never seen. I said, God, I don't understand how they're able to do that. He said, Dylan, They've experienced pain you'd never even think. And it's in the greatest forms of pain that can produce my greatest peace. Church, I don't know who you are or where you're at today. I can assure you, you're not going through what they went through. But I'm not here to minimize your pain. That is not my point. I'm not here to act like the lack of peace in your life doesn't matter to God. It absolutely matters to God. We're all loved by God. But here's what I want you to know. You can have the peace that Jesus is talking about in every season when we understand that he is an everlasting father who we can trust every single time. Can I get an amen, somebody? Like, I'm not talking hearsay today. This is real life. There's been so many seasons where I just struggled with feeling loved. I struggled with, with having peace. And the longer I follow God, the more peace that I have. And I know some of you today, you're kind of the rocks in your family. Christmas is, you know, approaching. The the family gatherings are approaching. And you can't wait for the political conversations at dinner, right? You can't wait for that story to get brought up again. You can't wait to see that person who you can't really stand to be in the same room with and can I encourage us this Christmas season that when we feel that lack of peace coming let's remember the father's love for us and he loves everybody and when we do that we get to experience the prince of peace but where does that apply in the Christmas story right that's what we're here to do today to hear about the Christmas story I want the team to come Luke 2 
verses 8 through 14. Many of you have heard this story. Some of you, maybe you've never read it verbatim, but you, you've at least heard bits and pieces of the shepherd's story. But it says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Don't you know that shepherd's like, Praise God, he said, don't worry in that this is good news because I'm scared right now. I sure would be. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the house of bread, the, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby, not some political king on his throne who's 40-some years old and been working his way up through the ranks. No, 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 no. You're going to find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth lying in a manger because there was no rooming, no lodging available for him. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace. Somebody say peace. On earth to those with whom God is pleased. Christmas is about many things, and one of those things is that in one moment, the peace that the world had always sought was now here. You ever been desperate for peace? You ever just been in a situation, you're just like, man, God, I need it right now so bad. I remember as a kid, not knowing that God loved me, not knowing that, that any of this was true. I just remember just wanting a peace, and I didn't know there was a peace going back to my siblings. I remember telling them, it's all going to be okay. I needed to give them reassurance that right here in this moment, it's not good, it's not okay. But I was telling them, it's going to be okay. But I didn't know. In the moment, 16 years old, God comes up on the scene, changes me. I knew from that day forward, and here I am 13 years later telling you that peace occurs in every situation. The peace you've longed for is in Him. That's what Christmas is about. Shepherds were rebels. They, had, they were considered low-life people. You had the religious people in the city. You had the shepherds outside the city. In Jesus' announcement about his birth was brought to those individuals. The next time that you feel like you are unworthy to be in God's presence, unworthy to carry the name of God because you messed up too much, look no further than the Christmas story. But in that moment, peace arrived and it changed not only their lives, but every person's lives of mankind forever. Here's where I want to end. Mom, dad, kids, male, female, this Christmas season, Brennan said it very well last service. You either have it or you don't. You either have the love or you don't. You either have the peace or you don't. And let this season be the time for you to tap back into it. What do you need to do to experience it? Here's what's crazy. You don't need to go and sell all your belongings, give it to the poor and all those things. You don't. All you have to do to begin is to say, Lord, I've sinned against you and I need you. We'll work out the details. We'll show you which path to take down the road. Don't worry about that. Listen, the church is for the hospital for the sick. Meaning, I pray that this isn't a museum for the saints where we come around bragging on how holy we are. I pray that this is a place where people know in my worst moments, on my baddest days, that there is still a place where I can call my church home. That's what Christmas was about. But many of you today 
are trying to operate like you have the peace of God and it's killing you. So here's where I want to end. I'm very well aware that I said that five minutes ago, but now truly, truly, when is the last time you felt, and I'm talking to the grown men, I'm talking to the grown women, everyone, especially, because there comes a point in time where we quit getting told, good job, and I'm proud of you. job and I'm a grown man and I'm a grown woman and I got, got to pay bills and all that stuff. Did you know your Heavenly Father is rooting for you every day? And what I would love to do is I would love to pray a prayer over you of love, pray of fulfillment in the Father, pray of care, I'm not ignoring the whole sin message and that's what it was all about, but today I feel God just wanting his children to know he's proud of you and you can have his peace. So would you close your eyes? God, I just think the other day, a good friend of mine goes to this church after we meet, just says, hey, I hope you know, I'm proud of you. I've seen how far you've come. And sometimes we forget to take a step back and go, yeah, I guess, I guess I have come pretty far. God, I feel like there's sons and daughters here tonight, this morning. They've been in the grind for so long in school and in work and the hustle, the grind and all of that and paying the bills and raising kids and just going and going and loved ones coming and going in our lives and all this and, and we just go and we go and we go and we, we try to go to church and we try to do this and we try to do this and we go to the Christmases and we go to this and we go to that and I just wonder if sometimes we forget that God is saying I want to be one with you I want to tell you in the morning I love you and maybe you're like me. I was like, do you still love me that much? Even when I've missed it? Even when I've gotten too busy? Even when I love you? And I'm with you, Emmanuel. Sweetheart, God is with you. He's proud of you. He's lifting you up. He's saying, that's my girl. I'm so thankful for you. And some of you today, you've gotten some battle wounds. You've gotten some scars. You haven't been told how worthy you are in a long time. And I'm not saying this in some secular sense. No, we aren't worthy. But God is telling you, as you are a child of me, I cover your sins. I redeem your past. And I am telling you, I love you, child. I love you. I love you. Sir, I'm proud of you. Way to keep going. You, you, you showed up today. That's a win. You came. I feel like people need. Call it lame. A holy hug today. And I mean it. So here's what I want to do. If you're comfortable with the person next to you, if not, I don't want you to do this, but I... I just want you to lay a hand on them. And with your other hand, I want you to just leave it out. I want you to receive this. I pray that it's a prayer that resonates with the everlasting Father. God, I pray that your son and your daughter, no matter how young, no matter how old, knows how much you love them, how much you care for them. And maybe like a shepherd in a night, they just think they're doing another job. And 
their reputation isn't the best, or they could be this or this, but they're feeling so average and left over, or left out and looked over. And God, I pray they know you love them, you care for them, you have a plan for them. Keep fighting the good fight. God, Emmanuel, you're with us. So God, as we go into response, I pray that some sons and daughters, young and old, will come at these altars or stay at their seats and just even bow down maybe and say, God, you still love me that much? I love you that much. And I want to give you my peace. Speak to us, Lord. I pray this in your name. Amen. I want you to stand. The altars are open. We're going to worship. Don't miss your opportunity. Don't miss it. Let this be your season.